Thank you for uh, the opportunity to present this particular material about uh, Paleolithic nutrition, more in the context of sunshine and vitamin D. Um, and it starts basically from the traditional old story of evolution. And one of the best articles, at least uh, from an intellectual perspective, is this one by Dobzhansky. And you can look it up on Google by simply typing in the word, nothing in biology makes sense. This is going to be number one on the hit parade for that. The originator of Paleolithic nutrition uh, in a lot of people's contexts is um, S. Boyd Eaton, who through the 1980s and 90s published a number of items looking at nutrition from the traditional evolutionary perspective. But one thing um, that I feel that they've uh, neglected was essentially vitamin D nutrition. And I guess one reason why this picture is interesting is everybody's bare naked because that's how we evolved. We are the naked ape. Um, we evolved in, in the tropics and even this scheme is wrong because the original human beings were black and not Caucasian light-skinned individuals. But modern, in the uh, evolutionary sense, humans existed on this planet for 100,000 years. And graph that you see here, the figure indicates the parts of the world that are inhabited by apes and monkeys are, are, are relatives, as it were. And we are unusual in that we don't even have fur. Um, we first, as Homo sapiens, evolved in the Horn of Africa around 100,000 years ago. And I would contend that is the part of the world for which the human biology is optimized. And I'll get into that in a little bit uh, greater detail later. But what we've done, here's a map of the world, and you're looking at distributions of human populations through the uh, decades, 1980s, 1960s, 2005. But you can see that human populations are increasing, and where are they particularly increasing? It's north of where we evolved, around 30 degrees north latitude, basically still south of Italy, but basically the latitude of uh, Florida. We've moved forward northward in the world, but I would contend we've not evolved to accommodate to that. And the key thing to bear in mind is sunshine and, and its uh, consequences, one of them being vitamin D nutrition. And these, uh, during the summer part of the year, people are always worried about the UV index, putting on sunscreen. If you go south, make sure you put on your sunscreen, etc. But this is a little concept that arose in Australia. They call it the sunshine rule. And there's some, uh, rational peer-reviewed pub publications to justify it. Um, you need a UV index if you're a white-skinned person, a UV index of about three. And you can tell that that's the UV index on a sunny day in most parts of the world when the sun is 45 degrees above the horizon, i.e. when your shadow is the length of your height, then you can start worrying about getting vitamin D or burning your skin. And as your shadow gets shorter and shorter, the UV index keeps going up and up. So if you're looking down and your shadow is simply around your feet, the UV index is probably around 12 or 13, maybe even 15. Now, as humans migrated northward in the world, there was a problem that happened. Of course, they had less and less sunshine, had to wear clothing because it was colder. And a couple of hundred years ago during the Industrial Revolution, one Thing they call the English disease happened and it was characteristic of bent long bones. A disease that happened because of a nutritional deficiency partly due to lack of vitamin D because of the lack of sunshine and sometimes perhaps lack of calcium. So the way bone grows is first the protein matrix of bone is deposited and subsequent to that you know, the bone initially is soft, but as the calcium and phosphorus dis, uh, deposit into that, bone gets harder and harder. But if it can't deposit quickly enough, especially along the epiphyses where the gro bone is growing, you get bowed limbs. Um, we have some, you know, storybook characters that are almost certainly uh, examples of rickets from a couple of hundred years ago, one of them being Tiny Tim from the story of Scrooge. And another one being a, a character from Central Europe, Heidi, a Swiss story, um, where she had a cousin named Clara who lived in the big city. And she likewise was very frail, rachitic, had weak muscles. And bear in mind, 
vitamin D deficiency is not just related to bone. It pertains to something called proximal muscle weakness. You have a difficulty standing up because your proximal, your thigh muscles are weaker, etc. And these children also were infection prone. Well, one of them, one of the reasons for that might be that the vitamin D influences the immune system, but during you know, the, the several decades in through the 1980s, people said, well, the reason they're infection prone is that they've got a muscle weakness. If you're not able to cough properly to get the infection out of your chest, you're going to be infection prone and more weak. Now, this Clara, the uh, vitamin D deficiency scenario, that relates to a probable serum 25 hydroxy D of less than 10 nanograms per milliliter or in more international units, um, 25 nanomoles per liter. But the story goes on that uh, Clara went to live with her cousin up in the mountains and Clara got healthier. She could walk. She was having no issues. But the problem, uh, the probability here is that her uh, 25 hydroxy D likely went up higher than 30 nanograms per milliliter just from sunshine, not even, not even eating specific kinds of diet. Now, with regard to rickets, the more ominous thing, the thing that's worse than having uh, bent limbs is that for a woman whose normal shape of pelvis is this, pelvis is this, um, her pelvis, if she has rickets, um, is misshapen and will not permit a natural vaginal delivery. A woman with severe rickets is going to die in childbirth and not have any more children. Now, the part of the world where we originated is the Horn of Africa. Most of us, if we're Caucasian, came from this part of the world far north. And here's a, a map of the world indicating um, UV of sufficient intensity to make vitamin D. Okay, so up in the north, we have relatively, you know, sparse scarcity of vitamin D. And I just want to talk about evolution and natural selection here. A species is optimized in terms of its biology for the environment in which that species originated or emanated from. So if you think about a given location, whether it's Africa or, you know, the Galapagos where, uh, you know, <laughs> not a mental block, um, where we got some of this uh, natural selection theory, you have a menu of potential genetics for a species. And on this y-axis, you have fitness. Fitness is not inherently survival of the fittest, it is survival of the ones who can have the most infants that then will um, go on to have babies of their own, okay? So within a given climate, you have this kind of diversity of genetics available and this degree of fitness for that. On the other hand, if you change the environment, you're not changing the genetics per se. What you are is forcing genetics to somehow select from the menu of what, of what is available. And Charles Darwin would say that perhaps it's not exactly in the optimal location anymore. And the key thing here is if you change environment, you may have some adaptation white skin in the north, for example, um, that will adjust, but it may not be totally optimal for the biology of the species. Here's what we know about latitude. If you look at the skin color of a person, you can estimate the latitude from which their ancestors came. And here's a, you know, a study that was done, uh, published in the 1990s. And here what you see is skin reflectance. In other words, the more reflectance from skin, the lighter that skin is. People who live in the tropics have relatively dark skin with poor reflectance. And on the other hand, those who uh, live in Scandinavia, you know, you recognize them as blonde, blue eyed. So the contention is that the reason skin color of people varies is because a lack of ultraviolet light selected for lighter skin colors. Lighter skin color allows more vitamin D to penetrate the skin allows the pelvis to form better and they will survive. Dark skin color in Sweden a thousand years ago meant you probably died in childbirth. However, you know, 
the amount of vitamin D that you can make in the skin is independent of your skin color. The only thing that skin color does, initially, if it is very black skin color, you know, for people living in the tropics, it can take them two hours of being out in the sun to generate their maximum amount of vitamin D in, for a given day. On the other hand, for a white person like me, I only have to be in the uh, sun on a day like uh, mid-June, 10 minutes on my front, flip over with my bathing suit, 10 minutes on the other side, and I've maximized my yield of vitamin D. A black person living in Toronto where I am may require two hours of being out in the sun and they're not likely to do that. Now, getting back to human biology, recognize evolution or natural selection hinges largely on the ability of a group of individuals or a species to have babies. And it's interesting to note that if you are over 45 years of age, evolution and natural selection really had no care about you. Your, your biology is not designed to live to age 60, 70, 80, or 90 if you're healthy people. Here's a table that's looking at um, ancient, basically Stone Age populations. And the calculations are that the maximum age of these populations was in the low 40s. So if you only live up to 40 years of age, how can you know vitality or anything be influenced by the biology of somebody older than that? It's those reproductive years. Like recognize these, you know, in, in the Stone Age, nobody reached menopause. Everybody kept having babies. And if you didn't have babies, oddly you died. Who knows? Mm -hmm. I just want to change pace here a little bit and address the issues about vitamin D and its biology. Now, what is made in your skin, or even on the lanolin that's taken from sheep when they're you know, cleaning the wool that's going to become a wool sweater, you get 7-dehydrocholesterol, um, a compound that is a precursor for um, cholesterol within the skin, but it's unstable. And when ultraviolet light of the wavelengths B, in other words, around 300 nanometers, hits it, it breaks open the steroid type molecule and effectively becomes vitamin D passively by non-enzymic change. The vitamin D in your body becomes the thing that we typically measure, 25 hydroxy D, because this lingers in your bloodstream for a long time and it's the accepted measure of vitamin D nutrition, 25 hydroxy vitamin D. If you get a vitamin D blood test, it's kind of a misnomer. You're actually measuring 25 hydroxy D. This is the raw material with which to make a hormone. A hormone is a signaling molecule. It's a molecule that controls the way things happen in your body. 125 dihydroxy vitamin D classically was produced by the kidney, and its production went up when the kidney was relatively deprived of calcium. The kidney recognizes filtering all the blood that's in your, in your body, and it's filtering it over and over again. So it's a fantastic sensor for calcium levels, and it's a fantastic organ with which the hormone calcitriol or 125 dihydroxy d is produced and what it does it goes on through the circulation to signal the intestine to turn on the machinery to absorb calcium better so again um, you have 70 hydrocholesterol an unstable molecule when ultraviolet light shines onto it the molecule breaks open you see the broken uh, b ring of the molecule the liver turns it into 25 hydroxy vitamin D, sticking on a hydroxyl group here, and the kidney or some other tissues can make calcitriol. Now, recognize that um, the vitamin D system does many things. Classically, it's the raw material that you need in order to make the hormone to absorb calcium. But over the years, many tissues have been discovered to respond to the vitamin D hormone or even to synthesize the vitamin D hormones in small amounts that are localized and used just by the tissue. For example, the prostate we've shown is capable in vivo in the whole body of taking 25 hydroxy vitamin D and turning it into the hormone 125D. And in the prostate, 
that hormone reduces proliferation and improves the differentiation of prostate cells. Likewise, the colon, bone tissue, brain tissue, etc., can all utilize 25-hydroxy-D for their own signaling systems. I like to use the analogy of paper. By itself, vitamin D or 25-hydroxy doesn't do anything, just like a piece of paper doesn't do anything, until you use it to create a message. And the problem, of course, is if you've got too little raw material with which to make messages, institutions, if they were to lack paper, would be not able to communicate op optimally and mistakes will happen. In biology, a mistake is a disease. So the question here is, well, okay, we're measuring the nutrition level for vitamin D, 25-hydroxy, what's normal? Like anytime you do a blood test, the first thing any doctor or user of that test is going to ask is, well, what am I supposed to reference to? What's, what's normal? And I created a, a review some years ago where I took all the literature I could find about non-human primates. And uh, these are graphs, they're called box plots. The middle box indicates half the population that you sample, okay? 50% of the group is here. The top and lower whisker are the highest and the lowest values that are not statistical outliers. So if you had a healthy ape or monkey in a zoo, or if you captured them in the wild, their blood test result for vitamin D will typically be more than 100 nanomoles per liter, or in American numbers, more than 40 nanograms per milliliter. Now we've done studies and others have as well, looking at lifeguards, outdoor, well, not quite outdoor workers because they tend to wear clothes, but people who go to suntan parlors for two or three weekly treatments, they studied these through the 1970s to try to understand what's the biological amount of vitamin D that humans produce. And the blood test results for adults exposing skin to sun or ultraviolet, their blood test results were more than 80 or more than um, about 35 nanograms per milliliter. Now, when I set up our lab's vitamin D assay, I'm in Toronto. Toronto's on the same latitude as uh, Rome, or pretty close to the same as Omaha or even Boston, just a degree or two off from them. And to my shock, uh, when I set it up, my value was uh, 39 nanomoles per liter. I was way down here. And the uh, recommendation for the Institutes of Medicine is you should have a level that's higher than 40 for sure. So these numbers, yeah, bear in mind that they were taken in, the, in February, um, and most people were less than 80 nanomoles per liter. We did a, a couple of clinical trials, but this one uh, on the right is the results of a clinical trial of people taking 1,000 units of vitamin D um, for six months. That's just a little bit more than the recommended dietary allowance these days. So by taking 1,000 units, you were reasonably assured that your blood test result is going to be more than um, 50 nanomoles per liter, or in American numbers, more than 20 nanograms per milliliter. That black line is the number that uh, most of us, surely, even the most conservative researchers, would want us to be higher than. Next, uh, we looked at 4,000 units of vitamin D because, you know, when you think about it, a newborn baby, what's the recommended dietary allowance for a mom um, breastfeeding her baby? That baby should be getting 400 units of vitamin D per day. And as adults, we are about 10, 10 times the size of a baby. And logically, 4,000 units seem to fit in what we'd recommend for healthy babies. And indeed, um, the blood test result that we got for an adult taking 4,000 units is similar to what you'd have in babies getting a steady diet of 400 units of vitamin D. In other words, the number was more than 80 nanomoles per liter for most of them. And we averaged certainly closer to 120 nanomoles per liter. 4,000 units of vitamin D given to Canadians who don't get that much vitamin D through winter and spring gave them an average value of about 110 nanomoles per liter or um, about 45 nanograms per milliliter. So getting back to uh, humans, what's biologically normal? Probably a level that's 100 or so. 
And if we look back at some geography here, this is a, a, a nice diagram, I guess I get stuck on these kinds of things. This is month of the year, January, March, May, July, September. This is latitude. And the vertical axis is the amount of light energy that's produced per day, all day, throughout the year, that's capable, those wavelengths capable of making vitamin D. So this is, the y-axis is the vitamin D capacity um, within given areas. And recognize that in the tropics where we evolved, the amount of ultraviolet light B energy that impinges on the surface of the earth is five times more than the ultraviolet B energy that we get in Europe or Canada or Boston. It's far more energy that we were evolved for and we're moving way down here. And we ask ourselves, might there be a problem? Well, <laughs> for some people there's been adaptation. Like white people adapted to less ultraviolet light by opening up our skin, by becoming white, being selected to have white skin. Recognize there's no such thing as race. There's only a gene pool for which certain environmental factors influence some phenotypic characteristics. You might ask yourself, okay, we've got the original inhabitants, we perceive Stone Age man to have lived 100,000 years ago. Question, what would their vitamin D levels have been? Well, we have to take modern day examples of people that are reasonably close to that. And Muscita uh, and, and, and uh, Netherlands uh, anthropologists had some graduate students from middle of Africa, Luxwolda, and these are nicely uh, done publications. They went to Africa and looked at um, relatively native tribes and looked at their blood test results. And incidentally, the lab assay that they used was the same assay that I was using in Toronto. So our numbers are totally comparable. So the Maasai, those uh, you know, traditional, more herding uh, nomadic individuals, um, had blood test results that were about 44 nanograms per milliliter or 110 nanomoles per liter. But they also tested, oopsie, sorry, they also tested Africans who lived in the city. And the ones who lived in the city had blood test results that were more like average white Canadians. So in other words, black people who live in the big city in Africa have blood test results similar to Canadians. And I'll get onto this a little bit more. Because here's the story. You have a traditional African culture. They move to the big city. Their 25 hydroxy D levels approximate those of, of white Canadians. Incidentally, the graph on the right here are University of Toronto students, healthy university students with various ancestries, African ancestry, East Asian ancestry, South Asian, and those who didn't want to disclose what their ancestry was. Okay, so these healthy urban Africans with levels comparable to the roughly 60 nanomoles per liter that white Canadians have move over to North America and then end up having blood test results that are averaging in the 30s, 30 nanomoles per liter. And, and, and as you can tell, a quarter of them easily have a 25 hydroxy D blood test result that in, in a pediatric clinic would be diagnostic of vitamin D nutritional deficiency rickets. These are not kids with rickets, they're healthy, but their blood test result is crazy low during February. An interesting observation that looks and at all also found was that, you know, classically, you know, you've got this old wives tale. Sorry, ladies, I didn't mean it that way. Um, you've got an old story that um, says that as you get older, people's vitamin D levels go down. But very strangely, in the nomadic Africans, in, in the tribes, the traditional tribes, as they got older, their 25-hydroxy D level actually trended up statistically significantly. Their average values in these groups was 100 nanomoles per liter, but it trended upwards. Um, furthermore, during pregnancy, there were three, uh, again, nomadic tribes tested in different parts of Africa. At the the non-pregnant group had average levels just under 100 nanomoles per liter. But without taking a vitamin D supplement, these sun 
rich individuals had blood test results that went up to 150 nanomoles per liter on average and then declined after pregnancy. It wasn't just that one group, but different populations worked in the same manner. Why would vitamin D levels go up so sharply, up to well over 100 nanomoles per liter in people not taking a vitamin D supplement? It's well worth considering. May have a reason. <laughs> so you've got this cycle that goes on in natural human biology, but we don't have that. If you look up the vitamin D blood test results for women in Europe or in, in the United States, this is the range that you'll get them, especially for black women, they'll be lower down here. And if you think that the data from the Netherlands was maybe just a little bit quirky, these are data from Chicago. Durazo et al. published this in the Journal of Human Biology. What we're doing here is looking at um, average blood test results. This is a frequency distribution, right? And this is the blood test result here. Blacks in Chicago, and they've done it in international units, um, on average had blood test results that were 29 nanomoles per liter, which is about um, 20, uh, 12 nanograms per milliliter. They also had a group of people who went to Nigeria to measure the blood test results. And again, these urban Nigerians, based on researchers from Chicago, had the same kind of blood test results that the paper from Luxwalda did. And incidentally, they're the same numbers as you know, white North Americans on average. So if you wanna ask about racial discrepancies in a health measure, this one glares you straight in the face. Might there be a health consequence to having a lower blood vitamin D level? And why doesn't anybody tell people about it? <laughs> um, there's something else that goes on with latitude. What you have here is the vitamin D uh, effective ultraviolet light amount. In other words, this is ultraviolet light intensity on that axis. And this is the month of the year. Okay, down at zero latitude, the sun is bopping over your head twice a year, goes north, goes south, but you've got a substantial amount of um, ultraviolet light in the, in, in, the, in the place all year. If you go up to 40 degrees north latitude, which is sort of New York City, et cetera, you've got what people might call a vitamin D winter. We have parts of the year where you don't have enough sunshine to produce vitamin D in the skin. And it, it creates something else. It means that your blood test result for vitamin D hops up and down all year. On the other hand, there's been a report, and this one's published by um, uh, the Mayo Clinic. They had data from uh, men in Tobago. Look at the blood test results for men living in the Caribbean. 35 nanograms per mil, 34 nanograms per mil, 34, oops, 30, 30. <laughs> let me review these things slightly. Okay, so the point here is, <clears throat> even for westernized black people living in the Americas, but if they live in the South, they've got high vitamin D levels, more than double, almost triple the levels of what blacks have in Chicago. And those levels are not fluctuating all year, they're steady. I wanna address something, <clears throat> excuse me, because there's an interesting phenomenon it's called the vitamin D paradox. And it goes to say basically, you know, blacks have better bones than white people. Maybe they have lower vitamin Ds, but so what? They don't need as much vitamin D because we've got healthy black people and they, they're doing fine. And even official societies are writing that. African Americans need less vitamin D and calcium. They're fine. Do they need less? And there's even papers published in the likes of New England Journal that says it's normal for blacks to have lower vitamin D levels. It's just the way their biology is. For example, here's an, uh, an illustration of the vitamin D paradox where you're looking at the age of people. And yeah, this is total body calcium. This is basically how much calcium do you have in your bones? And as you can see, no matter what your age, if you're black, you have more bone than white person. White people have less bone. So there was a, a conference held, American government sponsored conference, 
that was asking, well, why do blacks have less need, need for calcium and vitamin D? And, and why do they have such great bones? I would say that's the wrong question. It's ne you're never going to answer an issue if you don't ask the right question, because where does it start? Who came first, blacks or whites? What you should be asking is, why do white people have weaker bones than black people? Blacks was the original color. There was natural selection that selected for whiter skin. If white people have less bones, there must have been a reason why they have less bones. Mm -hmm. So you've got a fitness benefit. What, what determines fitness? Is it what, you know, fitness is survival of the fittest. What can determine fitness with regard to bone? Well, we know that with regard to osteoporosis, um, white people have smaller bones, less bone quantity, different bone microarchitecture, mineral apposition rates different, but there's something that goes on. There's a cost to it. So for example, with regard to black, white women in, in the United States are conversely blacks. Blacks are more at risk of pregnancy problems, higher risk of requiring a cesarean section, why do you have a cesarean section? One reason is fetocephalic, cephalopelvic disproportion. Your pelvis may not be the right shape for your baby's head. White women have lower risk or rates of cesarean delivery than black women. And furthermore, if you are relatively deprived of calcium, with each pregnancy, you have something called osteomalacia. And with each pregnancy, the pelvis misshapes more. So traditionally, if you're already prone to cephalopelvic disproportion, each subsequent pregnancy will make it worse because the fetus is a big demand on the calcium of the body. And you take calcium out of bone and you may not be able to put it back. So here's the, the rationale for the concept that less bone may be better. So early on in life, you're forming bone. You've produced unmineralized matrix and that unmineralized matrix needs to have calcium deposited in it. These, um, these dots on this side indicate areas of bone that do not have enough calcium deposited in them. And some animal work has shown that if you have bone that is not completely mineralized or if it's osteomalacia, that bone is more prone to bending how does the pelvis misshape? It bends. If you have less bone, you can more completely mineralize that bone and it will be resistant to bending. For a woman in Europe a thousand years ago, she might have had less bone, but a better proportion, wider pelvis that would help her survive. The pelvis was not misshapen. There's a price to this. You may have more bone, it's not well mineralized, but later in life, eventually it does mineralize properly. And like blacks in the United States, there can be more bone, stronger bone, less risk of osteoporosis. But the price after menopause, which you know ancient societies hardly ever reached, the price of less bone is greater risk of osteoporosis and fractures. So again, here we go. You can find the article you know, by just Googling Veith Weaker Bones, uh, published just this year. You've got a normal pelvis and the pelvis of a woman with osteomalacia. I just sort of want to get into a, a sort of a side issue. You know, the way you properly diagnose bone quality in osteomalacia is through a pelvic biopsy. They, they can actually drive a, a sort of a hollow core needle through the top of the pelvis and get a bone sample on a population. And this was done on a population of car accident victims in Germany. And, and I have to say, the Institutes of Medicine Review of 2010-2011 highlighted this paper by Primo et al. as a basis for their dietary recommendation, cross-sectionally. Okay, so firstly, here you're seeing some examples of bone biopsy samples. You're looking at what a pathologist would look at under a stained um, microscope um, stain slides under a microscope where the pink indicates bone surfaces and bone areas that are not totally mineralized. This is the unmineralized protein that was deposited into bone. Okay, now the next slide 
what we're showing is firstly the 25 hydroxy D blood level, the ages of the various uh, you know, accidental death victims that were sampled for this population. But the rest of the graphs are showing that pink area that I showed you on the previous slide. There are different ways of representing the pink area. Up here, this is osteoid volume, the pink area divided by the total bone volume. Down here, you're seeing the surface, the, the length of the pink area divided by all the bone surface. And here you see the thickness of that pink bone area. And in theory, if you're eating a recommended dietary allowance quantity of a nutrient, only two and a half percent of people should end up with the disease characteristic that is you know, the primary outcome. Bone disease is the primary outcome measure for healthy vitamin D and calcium. What do you see here? It's not two and a half percent. This is 50 nanomoles per liter or 20 nanograms per milliliter. The Institutes of Medicine, the people who define the recommended dietary allowance says, okay, you take what we're telling you and you're only gonna have two and a half percent risk of osteomalacia. This is formally what the Institutes of Medicine contends. On the other hand, you can count for yourself. There were six osteomalacia measures here versus 20 there, okay? You've got a decent amount of risk of disease, or you can say, oh, try a different measurement. Okay, so this is six out of 28. Again, 39% probability of some measure of osteomalacia. And here we've got five out of 23 measures, 18% of osteomalacia. What I'm saying here is, the people who did the calculations for the recommended dietary allowance for vitamin D were wrong. It's a highly contentious issue, but even the journal Nature had articles explaining it this way. So as I'm getting toward the end of the talk, um, I'm getting into something that you, know, you could have a whole talk on. Does it make sense that higher amounts of vitamin D are only good for bone? Because as I indicated earlier, many tissues throughout the body respond to the vitamin D hormone. So what, you know, isn't it plausible that something might be happening? Don't pay attention to this busy graph, it's crazy. But there's a, biz, a beautiful article published in British Medical Journal by Theodorato in 2014. And, and this is what's called a meta-analysis, putting together all kinds of research you can look up the primary publications by going into this British Medical Journal article, but I'm just going to try to summarize it for you. Let me take a moment to explain the slide. So these are represented by forest plots. It starts off with a vertical black line that indicates a ratio, and it's the ratio of a disease event, a disease happening in the high vitamin D group divided by a disease happening in the low vitamin D group. If a ratio of vitamin D does nothing, people with high vitamin D are gonna have just as much disease as the low vitamin D group. In other words, the ratio is going to be one. It'll fall onto that black line. But what I've shown you as a guide is a yellow line I've drawn down this slide. And that is just as a guidance that shows that the higher vitamin D group had 50% risk compared to the low vitamin D. In other words, with low vitamin D, there was more disease happening. Now let's see what diseases might be affected. And you can start looking at these. Um, certain patients with aggressive prostate cancer, okay, the dot fell right on the unity line. In other words, no difference in risk. Um, for breast cancer, depending on quartiles, there was a number of studies, 21 studies that show more vitamin D lowered risk. Um, there were some other studies, just to be fair, of course, postmenopausal breast cancer, et cetera, if you wish to look at the details, there were some situations where you couldn't find it. So with regard to cancer, it's a little bit on the noisy side. It depends on what you wish to believe. Lymphoma, ovarian cancer, um, another prostate cancer collection, rectal cancer. So we start to get interesting around the cardiovascular disease area of the research. And for those, there's a pretty consistent lower cardiovascular disease events, such as myocardial infarction, stroke, um, different forms of stroke. Again, less disease with higher vitamin D. Continuing on down that graph, 
we're continuing the cardiovascular section here, but with regard to depression, people who have higher vitamin D have less depression, less diabetes, at least cross-sectionally in surveys, less bone fractures. And I think in particular, the one to bear in mind, cross-sectionally, people with higher vitamin D are less likely to die. With regard to the vitamin D hormone itself, it really did nothing with regard to, this is, you know, the vitamin D hormone measurement is a hormone. It is not related to nutrition and its levels relate to calcium, not these other factors. So don't think about 125D or calcitriol as having anything to do with cross-sectional health. Um, <clears throat> just to emphasize, the um, vitamin D uh, and sunshine component. Here's a, a survey of 20,000 women in Sweden who 20 years prior to this publication from 2016 by Lindqvist um, were basically asked by people interested in skin cancer prevention, but they were asked um, about sun behavior practices. And they broke the groups of women into those women, I never go in the sun, it's bad for my skin, I, I don't do it. I'll, keep away. Those who say, well, yeah, I'm okay with the sun one way or another, or those, if there's sun, I go into it, I love it, okay? On the y-axis here, um, you see the probability of death, <clears throat> and you can see the years follow-up, zero, five, 10, 15, 20 years of follow-up. So, after 20 years of follow-up, almost 25% of the women these are postmenopausal women, they were sort of at least over age 50, um, had died of cardiovascular disease, cancer, or other conditions. Those who were not afraid of the sun but didn't actively seek it out, there was about 18% of them still alive. And those who said, I really like going out in the sunshine, it was about 14% were still alive. So you look at the mortality, 25, 18, 14. And essentially, where was the protection? Well, not so much in cancer, but cardiovascular disease was greatest benefit. And then other death causes as well. I think it's an important graph. The previous graph that I showed you from British Medical Journal has criti criticisms. People go, you know, it's not vitamin D. You know, if, if you've got a high vitamin D blood test like you showed, it's because of your lifestyle, you know. It's, it's whether you're healthy, active, outdoorsy. It's not vitamin D. On the other hand, this one's interesting because this is not looking at vitamin D. It's looking at healthy, outdoorsy activity. And it has crit critiques as well. Because people go, wait, come on. We know that sunshine makes vitamin D. Put these things together. Um, you know, it may be nice to say, well, gee, I wish I had perfect randomized clinical trials on vitamin D. But like all of nutrition, you never get perfect clinical trials. The only nutrient that's benefited from randomized clinical trials is folic acid supplementation for pregnant women. And for that, it only takes nine months for the outcome to happen. With regard to sunshine and vitamin D, these are long-term investments that take longer than the four years that you might have a clinical trial going. So again, as you go through life, you never know the future, but what you can do is at least do things that you know adjust the risks in your favor being healthy and staying in the sun uh, taking some vitamin d eating fish these are all good things to happen so live your life in a way that helps your vitamin d or or, or uv exposure to stay up remember we evolved in an environment that provided a vitamin d supply that raised our blood test results to a minimum of 75 so if you've got a group, remember the box plots? If the bottom of the group is going to be 75, what's the average? Probably about 110 nanomoles per liter or about uh, 45 nanograms per milliliter. Low ultraviolet light environments selected for white skin and for less bone. But that doesn't mean we should deprive black people of the knowledge that maybe they need either more sun or an easy technology solution a little bit more vitamin D. So again, people who live their lives so that their blood test result is higher than 75, be it being out in the sun or taking a supplement or trying to eat a lot of fish, 
have better health outcomes. There's no denying that. And I put this graph on, the figure on the left, because you know, you look up, you know, healthy sunshine, tanning, vitamin D, and you don't get that picture. You always get some bikini clad, bikini clad babel on the beach. But this picture is more important. Because if you do all those things that are the good things, you're going to be this bikini clad baby on the beach. And maybe your little grandson is going to stick their tongue out you, but you'll be there to smile back at them. Mm -hmm. And with that, I'd like to let it go for Carol. Um, you had a few words to say here. Thank you, Dr. Veith, for your presentation that I think gave us all a very clear answer to how does the population who have darker skin tend to have problems with vitamin D levels that has nothing particular to do, or at least it has very much to do with their color uh, of their skin, and which means it takes longer to be in the sun to get the required amount of vitamin D. That's very helpful in this time of challenge with various diseases that are coming up because in our mind as vitamin D researchers and ongoing things is that we've got to solve the problem um, of the deficiency epidemic. And the first problem to solve is to get people's attention. And unfortunately, it takes sometimes something of a disaster to help people get their attention to solving a very significant problem with, with many nutrient things of our body. Mm -hmm. We started as a result, Grassroots Health started as a result of a meeting with a whole bunch of researchers back in 2007. And Dr. Veith, and I will show you some others in a minute, but we laid out at that time, a group of scientists really wanted to announce that there was such an epidemic a long time ago. And so, grassroots health and our thing was to go forward with okay let's see what we can do to make it happen we have the scientists we have results of research that have been done we've developed literature we've gotten participation of thousands of people all over the world hopefully we've educated a lot we've anal analyzed it and certainly we've published it and we are always taking action but right now, we really need to move forward very quickly to help resolve this other problem that keeps coming up. At the point in time that we met over the course of, in 2007 when we started, my husband and I, Dr. Baggerly, was retired and a physicist. We traveled the country to meet with these scientists to say, what's the message? And they said, the message really is about the vitamin D level. And the vitamin D level, the 25 hydroxy D is what we were talking about, was the target range here was between 40 and 60. And that was primarily because that was the evidence that we could come up with at that point in time. And one of the delights of working with this group was over the period of time, um, these publications from the people living in the African climate which had their skin exposed most of the time, indeed, as Dr. V showed, are essentially in that range. I wanted to show you what some of these beautiful people are, and I'm truly honored to have been at the forefront of vitamin D research and the necessity for it. Dr. Tony Norman uh, and Dr. Hollick were both part of the really early stages of putting vitamin D on the map and what, what is it and all of that. And Dr. Norman was probably the first person I met face to face. And then Dr. Grant, whom many of you know, has been responsible for a lot of sun information. And then Dr. Garland, famous cancer researcher, Dr. Gorham, an associate of his. And I think you probably know him because we just talked with him. Uh, Dr. Hollick, Grant, uh, are all people that have given us uh, substantial help and advice to be able to convert the academics to public health messages. Dr. Haney uh, was our research director for four years, and we are, again, very privileged to have worked with him. 
to get the information about how to approach looking at what a nutrient is. Dr. Lappy, Dr. Willett, Drs. Carol Wagner and Bruce Hollis from, and Dr. Newman, all from the Medical University of South Carolina, which has done substantial research with many things regarding the necessity of vitamin D and the birthing process and also the biology. Our really next step is, okay, what are we gonna do about it? There is a major issue with the idea of having a clinical trial, an RCT, to demonstrate that this vitamin D level and the COVID-19 has, uh, why, why does it happen to do anything with health disparities? And what we are trying to put together now, not trying, but we have put together, is really a community project that will be done at the University of South Carolina in Charleston with its first pass, but the design of it is going to be what Dr. Haney has always said needed to be according to how nutrients are measured. We have to measure the baseline measurement of 25 OHD, like when someone enters the project for these community projects to ascertain does vitamin D help or not, especially with health disparities. Um, why are twice as many people who are of dark color having more serious disease than others? Um, we need to measure the baseline and we will take groups that are not hospitalized. We're not talking about treatment, but we will take those that may have been diagnosed with antibodies, meaning they've already had some infection or um, exposure and or none, but they are not hospitalized type people. Um, at this point in time. We'll do that measurement and throughout, and we will be doing measurements on a regular basis, not just at the beginning and the end. Specifically, if the measurement of the first test that we do in their so-called control group um, is deficient or rank deficient, like less than 20, they will be tested again, and in two months, if they haven't gotten up well above that, they will be, again, supplemented. Their dosing will be adjusted so that they will be able to have the same level of achievement as the others. In other words, we do not need to keep them at a deficient level throughout the study. We will also, very importantly, measurement of the cofactors that Grassroots Health has very clearly demonstrated in our thousands of people cohort that it matters what your magnesium levels are. Your, as measured right now, we're doing by the whole blood magnesium, not the serum magnesium, the omega-3 index and vitamin C and calcium. And the end point really is the target achievement in this group of 40 to 60 nanograms per milliliter based on individual factors and the dosing will be adjusted to those. This trial is being presented as a randomized trial to certainly in collaboration with um, MUSC, Medical University of South Carolina, but we and they are prepared to support it at any group around the country that feels that they have a group that really wants to do this and we can set up many different community areas like that. <clears throat> and the other category of this trial is one that we will be doing, which is what we have called a field trial, <clears throat> excuse me, where we work with uh, groups like we have uh, a very large number of people that we work with in, at the University of Florida, where they're doing an RCT in-house, but there's also an open field trial out in the field, which gathers thousands of people. So please stay tuned for this. Let us know if you are interested in doing this and you can touch base with Grassroots Health and we will have that information for you very shortly. The real key that I see in this and is an absolute joy, I mean, <laughs> to see that we have actually brought to the forefront of the whole world as something that isn't just take a medicine when you get sick 
but let's include the nutrients and the cofactors to start really changing the goal of our lives, not to cure illness, but to create wellness. And I, my heartfelt thanks goes out to all the researchers and the population that have chosen to participate in this. Stay in touch. Thank you.